Uh, it gives me great pleasure to chair our next panel, uh, titled The Green Economy, What's Next and How Do We Get There? And we have an excellent panel to explore this, uh, uh, this question. We have um, Ram uh, Nidumolu, uh, who's the founder and CEO of uh, Innova Strat Inc., a Silicon Valley firm that advises leading companies on sustainability strategies. Um, we have uh, Secretary Elvira, the Secretary of Environment and Natural Resources uh, for the Government of Mexico. Uh, we have uh, Puran Desai, the founding director of Bioregional One Planet Communities, uh, a leading builder of sustainable homes in the UK and a network of builders around the world. And we have uh, Mr. Jose Luis Prado, the president of uh, Gamesa Quaker, a uh, Pepsi Group company and the third largest international uh, business uh, for Pepsi. If, if we want to continue working in this issue of the green, econo green uh, economy, what we want to do is uh, to, to know how many green employments are we creating, which is the cost of that, which are the social benefits, and, uh, of course, uh, we need to be working in some other programs. I would like to mention two of them. One is the temporary employment uh, program in which people of uh, indig indigenous communities and rural areas are giving maintenance to the ecosystems, to the lakes, to the streams, to the rivers, to the mountains, to the hills. And uh, on the other hand, we are working in the uh, private sector with a uh, program referred to reduction of emissions, water saving, reducing of packing materials, and uh, reducing uh, uh, the, the energy consumption. Uh, we have uh, at least uh, 90 million US dollars in just three years of savings. Savings directly applied into the, the industries, not in the government. And so, uh, with that in mind, we want to uh, demonstrate that if the, the private sector is working in these issues, they will have a benefit, they will have some savings, they will have a better performance. And what we want to do uh, in the future is to build with the Congress a climate change law in which we can include the objectives of reduction of emissions by 2020, 30, and 50. Excellent. And um, uh, Secretary Elvira was, uh, I think, maybe even being a bit modest in some of the accomplishments Mexico has made in this uh, area. Uh, one of the things I do is I spend uh, time with governments around the world talking about their low carbon uh, strategies, and everyone wants to know what Mexico is doing. Uh, that uh, Mexico's plan is held up as a, as, as, as a uh, model for how to do an integrated national strategy for uh, moving to a low carbon economy. Um, Ram, how's it looking from Silicon Valley? And what do we need to do to be more innovative in uh, transitioning to a green economy? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, being here. And I, I'm very aware that I sort of stand between you and lunch. So let me be brief as much as possible. What I see happening, and this is based on some work uh, that uh, I did in the last three, four years with about 30 plus companies, not just in Silicon Valley, but other global enterprises. This work was with uh, the late Professor C.K. Prahlad and uh, looked at the kinds of innovations that were taking place in these organizations. And uh, clearly, I'm preaching to the choir, it's really a choice between a paradigm of unconstrained growth and a paradigm of sustainable growth. What we find and what we continue to find is there is a break point, there's a transition difficulty in what we call stage two innovations, which have to do with internal efficiencies and value chain efficiencies and so on. Uh, between stage two and stage three, stage three is when you begin to develop sustainable products and services to the market. Stage four is when you develop new business models. So these were the patterns we observed. The big difficulty comes between stage two and three. And it's very much a mindset difficulty and orientation and attitude in terms of uh, rather than looking internally, looking externally to the good that you can do and the uh, business benefits you can get. And I think we're at a stage where many CEOs have not yet come on board. And I think that's an indication when the CEOs themselves begin to say this, that we believe in sustainable growth, 
These are the kinds of things we're doing in terms of products and services, business models. And when the core businesses, the middle managers and the core businesses begin to say this, then I think the sustainable growth paradigm has some legs. And I think this difference between the say and the do is very important. Two days ago, we celebrated Mahatma Gandhi's uh, 141st birth anniversary, October 2nd, and I'm just coming off a panel on sustainable growth. So I want to tell you a story about the importance of this uh, say do. This is sometime in the 1920s or so, and uh, Mahatma Gandhi was at a village, and this lady comes up to him and says, I have my boy over here, my 10-year-old boy, and he's just addicted to sugar, high-carbon sugar. You can see where the story is going. Could you please tell him to stop? And Gandhi says, you know, let me think over it. Come back after a month. Some of you may have heard the story. A month later, this lady again finds out where Gandhi is and brings his son again to him after, you know, waiting in line and so on. And then says, uh, Bapu, which means father, please tell him to stop. This time, Gandhiji says, stop. Stop eating sugar. And this is a role model, Gandhi the role model. So the mother turns to Gandhi and says, why didn't you say this a month ago? And Gandhi says, a month ago, I was eating sugar myself. <laughs> so that's important. Your behaviors, the actual behaviors of the CEOs, the core businesses, the middle managers, that's important. Not what you say, not what you advertise, not what you have in indexes, what you actually do as far as your core business is concerned. And I think we're just getting there. And I'll spend time later on in terms of the mindsets, the beliefs. I call it the three Bs. The beliefs, the behaviors, and the business models that will get us there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ram. Buran, how are we going to trigger a, a revolution in, in uh, building in homes uh, around the world? Uh, well, it's an interesting question, and, and thanks, Eric, um, for having the opportunity for that, and, and buenos uh, tardes, uh, everyone here. Um, well, our, our story started a, a few years back when we built our own eco-village, actually in South London, about 100 homes and uh, office space where we currently run our headquarters organization from. Uh, and uh, I stuck my neck out and bought the first apartment there. Uh, and I've lived there since it was built in, in uh, 2002. And we've monitored this development and I've monitored my own, own life. And the interesting thing is we realized that to get the sorts of carbon savings that we need um, to get whatever it is, an 80, 90, 95% reduction in, in, in CO2 emissions in, in the coming decades, we have to create whole sustainable ways of living. Uh, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, and one of the interesting things from that experience is, it's been a great personal and, and professional uh, experience, is that actually 70% of our residents in our development report a significantly increased quality of life. So I think there's a huge opportunity now here to look at the overlap between quality of life um, and sustainable living, or what Biregional call one planet living. Um, and we're taking those lessons. Uh, we created our own property development company, which is backed by a London stock market listed company, uh, just finished our first uh, uh, scheme, and we're actually outselling the market. And most of our competitors, we've been through a very difficult property market in the UK, uh, most of our competitors actually haven't survived the last three years but we're still standing, we generated a, a profit, and uh, we're outperforming benchmarks. And so we're starting to see this coming through, and that, this is for a development which, run, which is run completely off renewable energy, it's completely car free, but we offer services like car clubs, uh, green cleaning, uh, we organize local organic food deliveries, and that whole quality of life um, is really coming through, and I think we're starting to see opportunities uh, for companies to fit in to where municipal authorities are going, where people's um, uh, values are going in terms of how they want to live. And so, based on that, we're now working with developers around the world to take these One Planet principles internationally. And we've just opened an office here and would love to do a, a One Planet community in Mexico as well. So, huge opportunities. Um, and as business people, we love problems. And there's no bigger problem than, uh, than, uh, than climate change. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm ready to move into one of the apartments and have my organic uh, <laughs> produce from the local garden brought in. It sounds, uh, sounds very attractive. Um, uh, Jose, uh, uh, Pepsi and um, uh, Gamesa Quaker, you know, very influential and important companies. Uh, uh, what, uh, what are you doing to transition to a green economy? Uh, as we discuss how to build and sustain a green economy, uh, I, I am very glad today to have the opportunity to share some of the highlights of our green journey within PepsiCo and within uh, Gamesa Quaker in Mexico, the leading biscuits company. 
as you reflect on the dimension of the challenge we face, especially on the climate part, uh, it's clear that businesses and business leaders are demanded uh, beyond their traditional boundaries. The demand on the social, economic, and climate uh, uh, dimensions is huge. And to, be, uh, to fully uh, capitalize on the potential of businesses to do our part and contribute to what we do best, that is create products, services, and solutions, uh, I, I, I would uh, highlight the importance of setting the right mindset. The traditional business mindset won't cut it, won't get us there with the necessary speed. Uh, what we have embraced in PepsiCo is a, a philosophy of performance with purpose that says we want to invest in healthier uh, people and planet, and that will be also create also a healthier business. And that is that that uh, integration of purpose and performance is where we think the the sustainability of the solutions re really lies. The second area that we have learned is that it starts with savings. It starts with the, the notion of if I use less resources, which is good for the environment, for the community, this will also be good for the business as we said costs. What we have found is that that is only the starting point. When things get really exciting and, and interesting is when you are able to harness the energy of the whole organization and start to find business innovation opportunities and, and change the mindset from challenge to opportunity. Uh, we started our journey three years ago. Last year, we uh, publicly announced uh, an environmental commitment to reduce three commitments only. First, to reduce 25% CO2 in five years. Second, 25% less water. And third, to create the first world's eco-friendly line of packaging materials. That is where we set our goals. It was one year ago that we announced this. And the, what it's amazing when you en engage your whole organization is that it becomes not only a project, it becomes a culture, a way, a way of being, a way of winning. And uh, the team accelerates far beyond what the leader was expecting and becomes a cultural movement beyond specific initiatives. So the net result of that has been that we have moved our commitments. Uh, uh, practically, the result of three years have been done in one year. And we are very well positioned to continue raising uh, uh, our bar there. So, so uh, we have found that by integrating ourselves in the value chain, we can influence not only our company, we can influence our companies in other parts of the world. We can influence our suppliers. I was three days ago in Cancun talking my, to my customers, my wholesaler customers, how we, they could save money by uh, using uh, solar lenses in their warehouses. So you can go the whole value chain in, and influence it and make a, a, a bigger impact. But I, but I think we large companies have also another responsibility is how we help other smaller companies get into the bandwagon. And that is where we are also collaborating to get to the PMS, these small companies, to have access to this solution. Thank you, Jose. And Jose used this phrase, a cultural movement, uh, creating a real shift in attitudes in, uh, uh, in Quaker and Pepsi. And Ram, you also mentioned the, the importance of beliefs. There's sort of a sense that if we believe these opportunities are here, then we'll take the actions to look for them and find them. Secretary Alvira, uh, before we came in, you were telling us a little bit about a, a, a training program uh, that uh, the government has been supporting, because this idea of changing beliefs seems very, you know, fuzzy, but this sounded very concrete. Maybe you could comment a little bit about uh, how you're changing skills and, and uh, beliefs in government. 